If you have your Bibles, will you be so kind to turn with me to the Gospel of John? The Gospel of John. We're going to be in John 13. John 13. Now, before we get there, there has been something in all my ministry I have wanted to do. So, can I do it with y'all today? Yes. All right. So, we're going to start on this side. I've always wanted to take some selfies. So, do y'all mind? All right. Is that okay, Alice? Go for it. All right. So, I'm going to start on this side. Now, y'all make sure you smile. I've got Mark, make sure you smile. I'm going to come on this side of the post. All right. Are you ready? One, two, three. Whoop. Oh, it didn't click. There it goes. All right. Y'all satisfied with how it looked? Okay, we'll come to the center out there. Make sure you smile. Are you ready? One, two, three. Come over here. What? They're laughing because they're thinking, I can't believe they're taking selfies in church. All right, y'all make sure you get everybody there. What? Over here. Everybody ready? Matt, good smile, right? Royce, make sure you smile. Thank you, Mom. <laughs> Hold on for just a minute. I got to come back here to my favorite sound person. All right, what do you think, Chris? One, two, three. All right, Scott, stick your head out. Where'd he go? Oh, I got to go up here. There he goes. That's Brian. So, well, you know what? We're working on that, Matt. So here's, here's the reason for all that fun. Did y'all realize that in 2012, I don't have an iPhone, but iPhone did something that nobody else had ever done. They added a front-forward camera. And all of a sudden, people began to be enamored with taking something that we call selfies. And in 2013, that became the word of the year. Now what you and I now understand is we live in a social media world where people are largely measured by their worth and their self-value and how many followers they have on social media. The sad part is most selfies declare, look at me. In fact, if you'll notice, most people's selfies, they've really what? They've puffed their lips out or oh, they have these strange poses because they're wanting people to notice them. Now here's what I want you to grasp. The less we guard ourselves in this world of selfies, the more we turn the lens of this world upon who? Ourselves. Now, what you may not realize in all the fun of people getting selfies is that some individuals have really gone to great lengths to get that selfie. In fact, from 2008 to 2021, would you believe 379 people have died taking that dangerous selfie? I think we've got some of the pictures there. And what I want you to grasp is this. It's not just for people. Look at that. You've got animals who individuals are taking selfies of. And then you've got some situations that didn't turn out all that what? Good. Now, just to give you a little thought of how many selfies are being taken, I found this fascinating. There are 93 million selfies taken every day. Did you catch that number? 93 what? Million. That means there are 34 billion selfies taken every year. You and I will take an average of 450 selfies in a given year. Now, who do you think the largest segment of taking selfies are? They say it's the millennials, but I believe it's actually the Gen X's, which is underneath them. They say they will take 25,000 selfies during their lifetime. The average person probably takes one to four selfies a day. Uh, some take as many as five to eight, and others take as many as eight selfies. Now, I told my family this, but I thought it was kind of funny. 
Now, I'm going to volunteer at Northern as an on-call chaplain. So I'm thinking, all i got to do is go take a picture. You know, they could put it on a badge. Well, I go and fill out this paperwork, and then the lady says, I need you to go to occupational health. And I say, occupational health? I'm just going to be volunteering as a chaplain. What, i got to go to volunteer health? Oh, they got some questions over there for you. So I go over there, and they go and check your immunizations and all that kind of good stuff, and I understand that, but they need to take some blood work, I guess, to find out the various immunizations that you say you've taken if they're still in your body. But what was amazing is there was a young lady there who apparently is getting ready to be hired by Northern as a nurse or CNA. I didn't ask her, but she was sitting there, and I noticed when she came back with her little area that had been taking some blood, what do you think she did? She took her phone. She made a little face, and she took a picture, capturing what had been done with her that day. And I thought, isn't this amazing? Now, I was inquisitive enough, Tim. I wanted to say, so how many people are following you? <laughs> but I didn't. I resisted that thought. But we live in this incredibly curious world of ours. So here's what I want you to begin to think about. In what appears to be an increasingly self-centered world, where you have 93 million selfies taken every day. We are what? Self-absorbed people. How do we begin to learn to serve like Jesus? How do we begin to learn to exhibit Christ-like servanthood? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 24 tells us this. Don't be concerned for your own good, but the good of others. Y'all know the text in Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 through 28, when the Bible says, Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their great ones exercised authority over them. May it not be so with you. But whoever be great among you, may he be your servant. And whoever be first among you, you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as what? A ransom for many. Now, we talked about this maybe a few weeks ago. When we're younger, what do we tend to think about? What we're going to be when we grow up, right? But who in the world, as they're thinking about what they're going to be when they grow up, would ever say, hey, listen, I want to be a servant. That's what I want to be when I grow up. But Rick Warren made a powerful statement that I think is something that we all need to grapple with. He said this, If I have no love for others, no desire to serve others, and I'm only concerned about my needs, I should question whether or not Christ is real in my life. Now, he made this statement in that well-known book, A Purpose Driven Life. But he went on to make this statement. A saved heart is one that will want to serve. A saved heart is one who will want to serve. You may or may not have heard him, but Henry Nouwen, he was a Dutch-born Catholic priest, professor, psychologist, and prolific writer, made this statement. No Christian is a Christian without being first a minister. Whatever form the ministry takes, the basis is always the same, to lay down one's life for others. So here's what I want you to begin to think about. These two men who are well-respected, who they themselves have modeled what it is they've said, have all indicated that if we're going to really be serious about following after Christ, there's one thing we've got to be concerned about. We've got to be what? Servants. We've got to be willing to serve like whom? Christ. And that brings us to our text. John chapter 13, if you found your place in God's Word, for those of you who are able would you please stand as we read it together? Beginning in verse 12. The Bible says, So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? Verse 13. You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. For if I wash if I, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who has sent him. 
if you know these things, blessed are you if you what? Do them. Join me as we pray. Father, may we begin to examine what that means. To do as you set an example for us to follow. To serve others like you. And we ask this in your name. Amen and amen. And you may be seated. Now, sometimes I fail to take time to help you understand the context of some things. But I want you to take some time to take the context in of John chapter 13. I think it's really important. If you read the Gospel of John, you will know that the first 12 chapters have encompassed three years of Christ's life, basically his earthly ministry, his public ministry. Chapter 13 is the beginning of what I might call his private ministry. In fact, chapters 13 through 19 take about 24 to 36 hours. Now just take all that in. First 12 chapters, three years, the next several chapters, just a few hours of the Lord's life. In fact, John chapter 13 begins what we call that upper room discourse. Now, if you look at the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they put a lot of focus in on the observance of the communion, the, the taking of the bread and the blood and all that Christ did around the, what we call the Lord's Supper. John doesn't do that. John begins to focus in on something that the other three Gospels don't, and that is what? Foot washing. The washing of his disciples' feet. What I want you to begin to think about is in our text, Jesus poses them a great question in verse 12. He says, do you know what I have done? He follows that question up with what they call a powerful declaration in verses 13 and 14. You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. But then he comes with that punchline in verse 15. And what does he say? He says, for I have given you an example that you should do as I have done. You should do as I have done. Someone once said, a person's actions will tell you everything you know, need to know about them. A person's actions will tell you everything you need to know about them. So here's the question I want to ask you. If I was following you around in your typical day, what would your actions reveal about you? If I was following you on a given day, what would your actions reveal about you? You see, I believe with all of my being that if we be, really want to serve like Jesus, we've got to understand serving like Jesus begins with humility. Serving like Jesus begins with humility. You know that in that day and time, who were the people who washed others' feet? The servants, the Greek servants, you would enter a person's house and as a show of hospitality, their servant would come to you and wash your feet. Jews didn't do that unless they were a bond servant, unless they were working off a debt, they would agree that they would serve their fellow man by washing their feet. Now think about it, they didn't have cars in that day and time. How'd they walk? They, how'd they get around? They walked everywhere they went. And they had what on their feet? Sandals, Right? And so everywhere they went, what did their feet collect? Dirt. So if you knelt down, if you stooped down to wash the feet of the person who had entered your master's house, would their feet be looking like a nice pedicure? <laughs> no, they'd be gnarly. They'd be nasty. Right? But you, in humility, would kneel down and do what? serve doesn't that remind me of what paul said in the book of philippians when he made this statement do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit rather in humility value others above yourselves not looking to your own interests but each of you to the interest of others in your relationships with one another have the same mindset that is in what christ jesus so this morning i want us to really think about what does it look like to serve Christ in humility well first and foremost I think we need to understand serving others is never beneath any of us serving others is never beneath 
any of us. Now, help me. Who was it that set the example? Christ. And who was Christ? The Son of the living God. Can you just imagine, in that moment, in that upper room, divinity stooped down and served humanity. The creator <coughs> expressed his love and care by being a servant to the created. Can, can you just begin to think about that with me for just a moment? <laughs> you see, Jesus sets an example for us to follow. I just want to let you know something. In spite of what others might tell you, especially those who follow you on social media, there isn't anybody that's too important that they aren't willing to what? Stoop down and help meet the needs of other people. In other words, there should be no task that God asks you to do that you would say what? God, I'll never do that. You'll never find me doing that. Because you see, if you ever say that to the Lord, what are you actually inferring? You are inferring that you are better than him because even he did what? Stoop down and wash the dirty feet of the disciples. So put all that in perspective with me. Now, you may not know this gentleman, uh, but many remember him back in the early 2000s he played for the Washington Redskins that are now the Washington Commanders uh, his name was Alfred Morris he was drafted in the sixth round but he became their star running back now, he was only there for a few years he was later traded to the Cowboys and when he was traded to the Cowboys many of his teammates were very saddened because this is what they said about him he said he was not the typical NFL running back who had made it well he still drove the same car that he drove when he was in college. He was a guy who would often bike to the ball field. He chatted with the security personnel at the front gate. And he often hung out with the stadium workers before the game. Now, what star athlete does that? But here's the thing that I think is the telltale sign about Alfred Morris. When everything was said and done and the players had gotten their showers and they had their towels and the reporters had come and asked their questions and everybody had left what do you think happened to all the towels all the dirty towels they ended up on the what floor because the athletes didn't have time to take them to the hamper so guess who do you think went by and picked up every one of those nasty dirty towels and put them in the hamper alfred morris he made it his mission because he understood that if you're going to serve like Jesus, no matter where you are at in the scheme of life, nothing is beneath you. In every home game, he would walk around the Redskins locker room, and for the personnel who cleaned the towels, he would make sure that every towel was picked up and placed in the hamper so they could be freshly washed and prepared for the next home game. For you see, he understood that even though he was making it big, he wasn't bigger than anybody else in the world around him. A servant is one who understands there's absolutely nothing that is beneath you. Now, I don't want to be graphic, but I'll never forget in one of my first ministry experiences, we had a commode that got stopped up. They couldn't find anybody who was willing to go in there and unstop it. All you had to do was take a plunger. I walked in there and I asked, where's the plunger? And someone said, oh, pastor, you shouldn't worry about this. I said, listen, there is nothing that's beneath any of us. <laughs> Are you with me? So I want you to take that as a note. Second of all, I want you to note that as we watch this example that Christ did for his disciples, it isn't about who they are, but rather it was about who Christ is. It isn't about who they are, but rather it's about who Christ is. Listen to this verse that Paul talks about in Galatians chapter 5. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. 
Only do not use this liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is summed in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as your self. Now, we read the story in the Gospel of John, and it seems like a nice little setting. They're there in the upper room. They've had a nice meal. The Bible tells us Jesus withdraws from the table, takes off his outer garment, girds himself with a towel, pours water in a basin, and then goes one by one and washes the disciples' feet. But we fail to realize who's still there around the table. Judas. It's not until verse 30 that Judas leaves. So let me just get you to think about something. Jesus is going to stoop before Judas and wash Judas's feet. But Jesus knows who's going to betray him and who is that. Now, if it were me and I were writing the script, I would have said to my Father in heaven, Now, Lord, listen, I don't mind washing the disciples' feet, but now this guy who you have given this idea of, de of deceiving me and betraying me and hurting me and handing me over to the authorities, won't you have him leave? After In fact, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to stand up before the brethren, and I'm going to say, Listen, guys, one of y'all are going to betray me. In fact, it's you, Judas. Won't you go ahead and get on up? And let the rest of us enjoy the night in peace. But he doesn't do that, does he? Think about it. He goes around to every one of his disciples and tenderly stoops down, washes their feet, removes that towel and dries their feet, looking at them all the time in the eye. Now, why am I telling you all this? Here's why I'm telling you all this. Who's betrayed you? Who's hurt you? Who has spoken poorly about you? Or, better than that, who has misrepresented you? <laughs> you know what Jesus would say? Stoop down and wash their feet. Ooh. Stoop down wash their feet why because you see what is it in us that wants to do when someone hurts us especially if someone betrays us what do we want to do we want to get even don't we we want to set the record straight we want them somehow some way to pay but what does Christ do Christ says I'm going to leave that in the Lord's hands and I'm going to treat them and serve them like they are one of my what? Brothers and sisters. Now, I want to kind of get you to think about something. Serving others and genuine love go hand in hand. But what does that look like? How do we genuinely love those, especially those who have wronged us? Is your heart like my heart from time to time struggling with this thought? of stooping down and serving somebody who has said something and done something to injure you? What do we need to do? We need to ask the Lord to change our heart. And can I tell you how he has done that for me? He has done that for me when he gives me the opportunity to serve them. You see, he has a way of softening the edges and teaching me what it means to love others with kindness and compassion when he gives me the opportunity to serve them. And then we've got to also begin to think about this simple gesture, putting others first in our day-to-day -day experiences. Think about it. When was the last time you woke up and said, okay, Lord, help me remember the needs of others as I go about my day? When was the last time you saw a struggling mom at the grocery store trying to take care of her child and yet push out that buggy? And yet, what have you done? You've gone right to your car as though there wasn't any time that you could have done anything. What would have happened had you gone to that struggling mom or that struggling senior adult and simply said, may I help you with your uh, little buggy? May I help you put your grocery items back in your car? 
Just the other day, I was at Food Line in Yakinville, and I was watching this elderly lady with one of those smaller carts get to her car, and she was putting her stuff up, and I wasn't able to get there fast enough to help her put the stuff in the car, but she was parked in the handicapped spot, and that's a little ways away from where you put the buggies in that little area to kind of keep them in the parking lot. And I just simply said this. I said, ma'am, well, can I do you a favor? Can I take your cart back in the store for you? Oh, would you do that for me? Something simple, right? How many of you have ever heard of the name of William Borden? He is of the Borden Dairy fame. And what you need to understand is this. He was uh, heir apparent back in the early 1900s of his parents' wealthy estate. He was going to the Yale University, and his parents decided to send him on a worldwide trip. Now, in that day and time, you travel by what? Boat, right? He had come to faith in Christ under D.L. Moody's ministry, and while he was there, he began to really understand that there was something different about being a follower of Christ than what he had seen there on the dairy farm. So he traveled to Asia and the Middle East and Europe. As he was there, he began to have a growing burden for the needs of hurting people. So he sat down and wrote his parents a letter. And this is what he said, After I finish Yale... I may go on to school, but I want you to know I have a burden to become a missionary over in areas that are Muslim-led that need to hear about Christ. Now, his parents never said this, but many of his classmates said, isn't that such a waste to spend your time with people who don't even care about what you have to share? Now, what you need to grasp is this. That on his way to fulfill this, after going to Yale and then on to Princeton, he boarded a ship to go to China. But on his way to China, he had to stop in Egypt so he could learn Arabic, so he could begin to talk with these Muslim people in that area. But while there, he got spinal meningitis and within a month died. Now, what you need to grasp is this. When they were celebrating the way in which he lived his life, many of the young people who knew him were inspired that here's a guy who was a, what? Silver spoon in his mouth, yet he was willing to risk it all, give it all up to follow after Christ. In his Bible, he had these words, no reserve. When he had written his parents that letter, that he was going to become a missionary, he put in his Bible those two words, no reserve. Now his father began to think that soon his son's going to come around and realize how hard it is to make a living as a missionary. He's going to come back to the farm and want to be a part of our business, so I'll always have a place for him. But when he saw that his son was serious on his way to China, he communicated with him and said, Son, I want you to know something. If you're serious about this, then there will not be a place for you here in the family business. And his son wrote in his Bible these two words, no retreat. Not long before he died, in that month he battled spinal meningitis, he wrote these last two words in his Bible, no regret. No regret. See, what some had thought was a waste of life, and a waste of opportunity, he saw as following after Christ. Because he recognized it wasn't about who he was, but it was about who Christ is. And those three slogans, no reserve, no retreat, no regret, is what ended up on his grave marker. You see, we need to understand what it is it looks like to serve Christ. Now, I want you to also notice this, that when we serve Christ in humility, it's not only seen in how uh, we serve, but also our willingness to allow others to serve us. You see, as amazing as the display that Christ gave, what you need to go earlier on and look at is he comes to whom? Peter. Remember? And what does Peter say? Uh, Lord, you going to wash my feet? Now, that's a strange question because he's just seen him go around and wash everybody else's feet, right? 
And Peter says, listen, Lord, you're never going to wash my feet. And what does Jesus say? Jesus says, listen, if you don't let me wash your feet, you can have no part of what it is I'm doing. And so what does Peter say? Well, listen, let's just not stop with the feet. Give me a whole bath, head, hands, everything. So what I want you to grasp is this. It's not just about you serving others, but it's also about you willing to allow others to serve you. Think about it. Jesus shows up at a dinner. He's sitting there observing all the things that are happening and what transpires. But a woman who had a reputation comes and anoints his feet with what? Oil. And the people there are saying amongst themselves, we can't believe that this man who is supposed to be a teacher is allowing this sinner to do such a thing to him. He allowed somebody to serve him. So can I just ask you this question? It is easy for us to do for others, isn't it? But it's awful hard sometimes for others to do for us. I'll never forget when I first got in ministry. I had a person, when I was just a, a youth director, I had a person walk out one Sunday morning and say to me, I just want you to know how much we appreciate what you're doing with the young people. And I could tell when he shook my hands, he put something in my hand. And I didn't know what it was. And so when I opened it up, it was a $20 bill. I had never had anybody do that for me before. And I'll never forget, I turned to the pastor I was serving with and I said, excuse me. I went running after this man in the parking lot. And I said, listen, listen, listen. I, I, wh what are you doing? What did he say? I just want to bless you. He said, oh, I, I can't accept this. I can't accept this. And he said something to me that I've never forgotten, Brenda. He said, are you going to rob me of a blessing? Are you going to rob me of a blessing? See, don't we get a blessing when we serve others? So therefore, we've got to be willing to let others serve us. Amen? But what stops us from letting it happen? Our pride. Right? Because sometimes when we allow others to serve us, we are acknowledging that we might not be able to do for ourselves what we want them to think we can, and we become vulnerable. But I just want you to know something. This whole diet of serving like Christ isn't just about giving. It's also about receiving. And that leads me to my last point that I want to share with you. And that is this. That when you and I serve others as Christ gave us the example, out of obedience to follow him, there will always be a blessing. There will always be a blessing. Do you have your Bible still open to John chapter 13? Look at verse 17. Look at verse 17. What does it say? Verse 17 says, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them it's not about what we what no but it's about what we do with what we know blessed Peter shared this same sentiment in first Peter chapter 4 as each one of you has received a gift minister that gift to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God Paul reminded us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor in the Lord is never in vain. Solomon, in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs eleven twenty five, 25, said this, Whoever brings blessing will be enriched, and one who waters will himself be what? Refreshed. It comes full circle, doesn't it? <laughs> now, those of us who are a little bit older will remember these days. Uh, but from July 26th to August the 7th, 1971, the eyes of millions of Americans was fixed to their little black and white console because Apollo 15 was making an incredible moon mission. And in that little capsule were David R. Scott and James B. Irwin. They landed on the moon and they spent 18 hours of their 66 hours out on the surface 
of the moon, riding over 17 miles in a little a device, a little car, what they call the moon buggy, getting all kinds of samples. James Irvin, as they were making their way back to Earth, before they splashed down, began to think about all that he had had the chance to enjoy. Now, he's a Christian, but he understood that because this uh, mission had been so just miraculous, that in some ways he had to fight the image of becoming a celebrity. And he made this statement, As I was returning, I realized that I am a, not a celebrity, but I am a servant. So I am here as God's servant on planet Earth to share what I have experienced that others may know the glory of God. I am here to share my experience with others so that people might experience the glory of God. Of God. Amen? Friends, we are to serve like Jesus. It begins with humility, <laughs> but it ends with the promise of a blessing. I want to show you a video as a part of our invitation this morning. It's a song that Siwak Prophets came up with a long time ago called Live Like That. Now, I'm just going to be honest with you. For those of you who are senior adults, there's a little beat to it. And I know that sometimes when that happens in church, that sends everybody a little wonkers. But that's okay. Because what I want you to do is I want you to watch the story that's depicted in this song. It's the story about a young man who begins to watch the life of another young man who goes to church. And I believe as you watch the video you'll begin to see what it was about that young man's life that spoke such volumes to the other that he began to have the resolve, that's the way I want to live. You see, the greatest compliment that could ever be given to you and I is that we might serve others in such a way that someone would ask, by the way, why are you doing what it is that you're doing? These bikers who were showing up to help Tiffany, these individuals who will be cared for. I'm just telling you, when you begin to do the extraordinary that might seem ordinary, people ask, why? And when you're able to say, I do this because of all that God has been so good to do for me, it opens up a natural opportunity for you to share of your faith. So in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand and to watch this video. And as you're watching it, if for some reason God begins to work on your heart, that maybe there is somebody he wants you to serve. And can I just be candid? It may have been somebody who's hurt you. It may be somebody who's misrepresented you. It may be somebody who, as others would say, has always been the thorn in your side. God wants you to serve. Why? Because the Bible tells us we are to follow his example. Maybe you're looking for a place to belong, a church that's not perfect, but their, uh, their arms are open, welcoming those who God brings. Maybe for the first time, you want to give your heart to this person who stooped down to wash the dirty feet of his disciples. However God moves during this time of invitation, may it be a sacred time when we are obedient to how God leads all of us. Let's stand together.